Extreme ride is a ride where there's something going on all the time. A lot of different forces. There's negative Gs, positive Gs. Yeah, it's tight. And more than anything, it's got speed and tons of it. Higher, farther, faster. Can there ever be a limit to an extreme ride? The technology is amazing. It's smooth, it's fast, it's powerful. And to add to the thrills, there's always something new. An extreme ride is a real kick in the pants when it comes to sending him on a great thrill. When you get done, you're left without anything to say, or you're just screaming your guts out, either with fear or you want to get in there and do it again. The latest generation of extreme rides reveals just how far most of us are prepared to go to be terrified. If you have the heart and the stomach, hold on tight. Superman is an extreme ride because of its speed and its power. It is definitely one of the fastest, most intense rides I've ever been on. Our first example of extreme fun can be found at Six Flags World of Adventure in Aurora, Ohio. When the ride begins, the acceleration from zero to 72 miles an hour is just a rush. And then all of a sudden, you're shooting up into the sky, and the track is twisting up in front of you, and it just dead ends. You feel totally as you fly up there. And then when it stops and falls backwards, it's just, just totally disoriented. And then as you fly backwards through the station area, the coaster again accelerates, only this time in reverse. And then you find yourself 180 feet up in the air, facing straight down at the ground and it is just totally bizarre. Superman rules! Over Ohio, like the horns of a giant animal, Superman is the world's first vertical spiraling coaster. The enormous U-shaped ride was made by Intamin of Switzerland. It's 630 feet long, but because riders go forward three times and backwards twice, they travel a total of 2,700 feet. Superman is a suspended coaster where the cars hang below, the track is up above as you see the wheels are up above you, and the shoulder restraints, harnesses are locking you in down on the bottom. The ride seats allow passengers' feet to dangle freely in space. So how does Superman accomplish its flying start? Superman is a linear induction propelled roller coaster. Linear induction motors, or limbs as they're also called, allow Superman to propel riders forward at high speed. These white blocks are limb motors. A limb motor is taking an electric motor, cutting it in half, opening it up and laying it flat. As I'm going down here, each one of these limb motors are firing, propelling the train faster down the track from zero to 70 miles an hour in approximately 140 feet. That's almost 28 meters per second. I have ridden Superman probably close to 100 times this year. Awesome ride, awesome. And I love it. I haven't had a bad ride on it yet. First time riders, it can be very terrifying. Oh, yeah, it's not over yet. Ah! A good roller coaster not only must be scary, it's got to look scary too. vertical points on this coaster sway after the train traverses that section of the track. And I've watched people in line just get very uneasy about that. But they don't understand that this ride is built of steel and it is supposed to sway. Um, if it didn't, it would break. If it's any reassurance to those brave enough to ride on it, the engineers do guarantee that it was installed with extra safety systems. Superman's a really smart roller coaster. We have a massive computer and control system underneath this attraction, and we use fiber optics at the speed of light to know exactly within one centimeter the location of the train at all times. The fiber optic sensors are placed along the overhead track. This is the rig that the fiber optic sees or not sees to count the position of the train. It sees through here, 
and the fiber optics do not see through here. And here's the speed sensor module that part of the fiber optics works on. Underneath the station, a number of computers control the propulsion and safety of the ride. This is our control room. This is an example of the thigh wristers and drives that power each limb motor that you saw up above us on the platform. There's enough amperage on the launch of 5,200 amps to power an average of 26 homes each time this train is sent. Here are the inverters that take the power and change it from AC to DC and back to AC and back to DC to help in the launch of the train. As you can see, there's a lot of copper in this control panel. In fact, in the whole control room down here, there's over seven tons of copper used. Here's the two computers that control Superman. We use two computers for redundancy. One backs up the other one so that we have the ultimate safety. The stomach-churning, gravity-defying moment of weightlessness at the top of the tower is also administered by the computers. This cabinet here and the contactors that are inside have the sole purpose of operating the limb motors that are on the straight tower. They hold the train for one-tenth of a second at a dead stop, and we use an additional 5,200 amps of power. The insatiable John Blakemore is making his 101st trip aboard Superman Ultimate Escape. Just been on Superman's ultimate escape at Six Flags, Ohio. The next extreme ride is the latest attraction at Bush Gardens Tampa in Florida. Already known for its exotic wildlife and two top roller coasters, Montu and Kumba. The creative team wanted their new African adventure to feature four-wheel drive off-road vehicles on safari through rough terrain and raging rivers. We needed a, a ride. A concept, uh, a reason to be, and we have a rally. So each vehicle is going to go out on their rally. And then uh, towards the end, they kind of start losing their way, and that's when they get into trouble. That's the adventure part at the end. 18 months into development, Mark Rose looks at the attractions alongside the track. We have our own herds of animals at Bush Gardens, and since 1967, we were the first zoo to incorporate mixed herds in large areas. So we've had a very a long success at, at doing this. I think every zebra we have is pregnant, and, and those babies will be born on Rhino Rally. So we're looking forward to that. We're completely renovating the terrain and landscaping of the North Belt. 16 acres were carefully prepared for the safety and comfort of a wide variety of animals, including the extremely rare white rhino. Barriers that keep the animals on the North Belt and in Rhino Rally are almost invisible to the eye. We tried to hide all the barriers to our guests and, uh, and keep the animals in the places we want to. We want to control where the animals are at so we can control their diet, uh, make sure that their behaviors are the way we want. And some animals uh, don't quite cooperate and get along with the rest of them. The easy part, I think, is the extreme part to make the ride thrilling. But to incorporate that with live animals is, is a challenge. But it's the best part, and it makes it so unique and different. Every ride is different. Because of the live and exceedingly patient animals, no two rides will be exactly alike. Our guests exit the animal portion of Rhino Rally by going through a pit of Nile crocodiles. As they look out their window, there could be Nile crocodiles swimming right next to them in the water. But then that navigator makes a wrong turn. That's where everything goes crazy. 
This is the last stage of the Rhino Rally, where the riders are led to believe they're going in the wrong direction. The driver seemingly tries to take a shortcut by crossing a raging river on a pontoon bridge. I think I can make it across. Hold on. In the space of a few seconds, the off-road safari becomes an in-water ride. The quick rope! We're floating in the water! It's no accident of design that, in fact, the vehicle travels along tracks positioned under the surface of the water. More than 10,000 gallons of water are required each time to create the flash floods. stuff, adventure stuff, extreme stuff. Most fun you'll have at seven miles an hour right here at Bush Gardens. <laughs> Knott's Berry Farm in California wanted to add a new extreme machine to its already large collection. It had only a relatively small area, 28,000 square feet, for its latest thrill ride. So why not something tall, steep, and wet? is the highest and the steepest water flume ride uh, around. Oh, it's the drop. The drop is insane. It, it, you look at it from the ground and it looks steep when you're on it. It looks over steep. Which is exactly what the planners had in mind when they dreamt up the perilous plunge. Once you're at the top, it's 127 feet and just a few seconds coming down. After the perilous plunge, riders are brought to a sudden but safe stop thanks to an innovative magnetic braking system developed by the rides manufacturer Intamin of Switzerland. Magnets run along the tracks and on the bottom of the boat. The nice thing about a magnetic braking system is that it requires no electricity. It works in the same principle as the magnets that we played with when we were kids. The magnet on the boat reacts with the magnet on the ride and brings the boat to a nice, slow stop. It's as simple as that. 14 times at 55 miles an hour, stopping at 135 feet. Now that's smooth. To get the riders extremely wet, we use a 750,000 gallon reservoir. In addition, we have 125,000 gallon per minute pumps. We're in the thrill business. We know how to get them wet. How wet? Soaked. And there's no escaping it. Little wonder the ride is known as the perilous sponge as well as the perilous plunge. And don't think you'll escape a drenching if all you do is stand and watch. If you don't want to ride the ride, you can always stand here and enjoy the view. Don't worry, you won't get wet. As with virtually all rides, the perilous plunge has its addicts. Nigel's been on it more than a hundred times. I'm afraid of heights, I'm afraid of water, but I, I force myself to go on it, and I love it. It's, it, it's exciting, you get that little thrill in your, in your stomach, that, uh, that, that, that frightened, child-like feeling, and then it's over, and then you want to go again and again and again. It's wonderful. Right now we're going up the lift, which is 127 feet. But that's not the scariest part. The scariest part is have 75 degree drop, 117 feet high, and a beautiful view. 
Except I'm terrified of heights. Well, we're at the top of the lift right now. Woo! I hope the elevator doesn't feel like this. Here we go! So we ready to go on again? Yes! This is Palest Plunge at Knott's Berry Farm. We're gonna go look for a towel. <laughs> the Legend is an extreme ride because it just doesn't let up. It's nonstop intensity, nonstop action, loaded with airtime. It's just, it doesn't give you a chance to catch your breath. With three big drops, four tunnels, a double helix, it's a very exciting ride. If you go down to the woods of Indiana, you're sure of a big surprise. A whirling dervish of an extreme ride. A wooden roller coaster called the legend. I think a wooden coaster can be an extreme ride due to the fact that there's just more of an out of control feeling. It varies from time of day you ride it. It's just a more out of control sensation than a steel coaster is. Steel coasters seem to be a little more programmed. The legend is the latest attraction at Holiday World in Santa Claus, Indiana. The family-owned park first opened its doors in 1946. It may have had a Christmas theme in the beginning, but that was soon expanded. In 1995, the park started adding top-class thrill rides, starting with its now famous Raven roller coaster. We are a family park here at Holiday World and Splash and Safari, but what we've discovered is that families like thrills too. Roller coaster fans enjoyed the Raven's thrill so much, they frequently voted it as the number one wooden coaster. So, cashing in on success, the park built another in wood, the Legend, which became an instant hit. To me, an extreme ride is a ride where um, there's something going on all the time. There's not any slow spots. You're turning, you're banking, you're diving, you're, you're rising, climbing, and it really moves you around and there's tremendous variety. It's not just about height and length and speed. It's the experience, it's what your body feels as you go through the ride. And it's the art of the design as opposed to just the size of the ride. The art of the design began with preliminary drawings. But then, before going further, the park asked for other ideas from roller coaster enthusiasts. Some of the comments range from, um, gee, you guys already do a great job, I'm sure it'll be wonderful, to um, a couple of folks wrote uh, four page essays on what makes a great roller coaster. The theme of the Raven roller coaster had come from a story by Edgar Allan Poe. So the new one, The Legend, was designed and themed from another classic American story. The legend is based on the story of the legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. Ichabod Crane has to make a mad dash across a bridge and the Headless Horseman pursues him. Ichabod Crane loses the race. <laughs> Here at Holiday World, uh, our coaster riders generally do beat the Headless Horseman back to the station. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> so let's see if Jeff King himself can outrun the Headless Horseman. Climbing up the lift to the 113 foot level. We're going to get a great view and then a very intense ride. We're just about there. You ready, Paula? Let's do it. End of the first tunnel. Wicked. Ben Black's an extreme ride. It's the first of its kind in the world where you totally get into an electronic game where your score as you go through determines whether you're going to become a Men in Black agent or not. If you got the stuff, you may soon be one of the galaxy's finest. A totally indoor, totally dark ride experience that runs two separate kind of uh, ride experiences parallel to each other. This ride is a, a whole new experience. It's a a very special 
techno futuristic launch in one Agrenian day interactive ride. <laughs> Universal Orlando, already known for creating attractions that put guests into the movies, has created Men in Black, based on yet another motion picture. All right, MIB wannabes, check this out. We got us a situation of monstrous proportions. Everybody hit the streets. This is not a grip. Well, it's a pretty extreme story. You know, aliens attacking the Earth to begin with. So, uh, you know, Men in Black is, is extreme on a couple levels. One, the the environments that you run through, the characters that you interact with are, are fairly extreme. And then the, the gaming level, you know, adds a whole nother kind of uh, quality to it that, you know, kicks it up a few notches. Very impressive. Don't get too much better than that. The attraction took five years, from concept on paper to opening day. From the start, Universal's creative team planned it like a film, using storyboards to help iron out the storyline and conceptualize everything from the ride vehicles and zappers to the details of interiors. So while we're figuring out how the ride works and how it looks and the different animated pieces of it, you know, we're also figuring out simultaneously with that how the thing is going to sit in the park and what this whole complex is going to look like. Visitors will take a so-called secret entrance to begin their walk through the attraction. They'll go down to what's described as the operations center. Now, if you remember from the movie, there were many friendly aliens that we we worked together with to help other people come in. We have many offices here where people work. Some of them are specially climatized for the folks that live in like oxygen-free rooms. Oh no. Well, let's get out of there. On the way to the training center, Mike stops for a coffee break. Oh, hey, look, look, look. It's Zed's new MIB recruit. Hey, <laughs> looks like someone's scraping the bottom of the human resource pool. Live long and uh, eat your vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you rookies know what MIB stands for? More insect bait. <laughs> There are 160 animated aliens on display throughout the attraction. Each alien, such as this one, can have 250 moving parts to make it work. Some of these aliens were familiar from the original movie, but Universal also consulted with the motion picture crew to create new ones. Miniatures, or maquettes, were developed in the early stages of production. When this gets blasted, you know it it flies open and you see that there's actually an alien in the mailbox and you know it's all about how the aliens are are disguising themselves in our world and, and as we blast them with the uh, with the zappers they transition and become themselves it's really a, a blast and of course each and every alien has to be given its own unique voice It's um, something I'd never seen before, so I, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, well, how, how, much, how much deeper into my soul can I go to pull out something as weird as, as what I'm looking at? New scenes were also filmed with actor Will Smith, who starred in the original Men in Black film. As Agent J, his task is to advise the visitor trainees which enemy aliens to target. All right, the twins are telling me that this bug is about to go postal. See? See what I mean? Y'all thought I was playing. I help to assist MIB trainees in, in their journey to become real MIB. Because there's a lot of trainees, but they don't all become MIB. Y'all got an F, only because I can't give you a G. That dude in the back, you would have got an H. Even then, the MIB trainees have to continue a walkthrough before reaching their guns and vehicles. Along the way, they pass through a series of rooms modeled on scenes from the film. We recreated the immigration room in the attraction because it's really an iconographic part of the film. All right, boys, break silver. What was that, you miserable little under? Well, guys, I gotta go. Gotta go back to work. Well, here we are at the Men in Black training facility. Now, this is a highly sophisticated, intricate training facility. We process thousands of people through to see if any of them have what it takes to be a Men in Black agent. It takes 220 computers working simultaneously to make this happen. The training vehicles have also been designed with an authentic look. Each agent 
We'll have an individual zapper. The green light will come on when you hit a target. If you miss, the red light will come on. Let me give you a little hint on how to score a little bit. One spot out on the right, you gotta watch for it. But if you hit this target on the opposing team's vehicle, it'll make them spin and they can't get any points at that time. All right. Warning. I remember the red stinger. All right, here we go. Let's get them. Oh, oh, they got us too. We're both getting it. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Two vehicles travel simultaneously on parallel tracks. To add intensity to the game, the vehicles instantly change direction, tilt, and rotate throughout the ride, especially if shot by the opposition. Right next to our men in black training range is our maintenance bay. Now we have 46 vehicles. We run thousands of people through this facility every day. We have to make sure they're extremely safe because these things are real high tech and they work hard. Now Bob and Paul over here work on our third shift and they're checking out the vehicle. This is a motion base, the top swivels and as you can see underneath here, we said we had 220 computers. Well, we've got a, quite a few right here on this ride vehicle. These guys do a great job. Thanks, guys. On the rides, the trainees must target an army of enemy aliens in all sorts of shapes and forms to save the city. The automatic responses between weapons and aliens presented some challenges for the creative team. So uh, to do that with these zappers was, was pretty tricky because not only are you scoring points, which is not you know so terribly new, but uh, you're making something happen. So, you know, when you zap one of these guys, you know, something really wild happens. Your head does something or, you know, fog goes shooting out or flames pop up or whatever happens, happens by virtue of the guest initiating the action. The climax and the last chance to score points comes near the ride's end. A bug is tunneling under New York and he's the biggest bug I've ever seen. It's huge, man. This bug is out of control and these New MIB trainees have to stop him before he tears Times Square apart. The visitor should be able to tell by its size that this bug is the last one on the ride. I need you to do what you got to do, because because this dude ain't joking. When it's all over, the trainees can tell by their score if they're potential men in black. Well, we've taken you behind the scenes at Men in Black Alien Attack, and we've shared a few secrets, but you won't be remembering any of them. In the world of the extreme rides, a giga coaster is 300 feet or higher. By becoming the first full length coaster to break the 300 foot barrier and to achieve speeds of up to 93 miles an hour, Millennium Force earns its title as an extreme ride. There's nothing else like it I've ridden. I've ridden over 300 coasters and there's simply nothing else that I've ridden that even comes close to it. It's at Cedar Point in Sandusky, Ohio, looming over Lake Erie. It's a favorite destination for extreme enthusiasts seeking thrill rides that push nerves to the limit. Cedar Point began building Millennium Force in 1999 at a cost of 14 million pounds. Their aim was to make roller coaster history by breaking 300 feet and achieving speeds no other existing full size roller coaster could manage. To accomplish their goal, the organizers had to overcome the problem of limited land space. First, the Swiss manufacturers used a cable lift system instead of the traditional chain lift, reducing the length of the first hill. And the track length was also minimized at the end by using a magnetic braking system that could stop trains going at 65 miles an hour in six seconds. It worked. Now that it's open, Millennium Force has become so popular that hundreds of holiday makers race each morning to be the first aboard the monster. There's a stampede every morning if you come in the front gate, and it's like 
I'm not quite sure. It's kind of like the wave in the Ten Commandments, seeing the wave rush down the midway. It's all these people, and they're all running to the same place. They're all running to ride Millennium Force. Not everyone can be first. Most visitors have to wait for the experience. A lot of people, you work every day of your life and you do the same old things and you come out to Cedar Point, you do Millennium Force and you feel like you've really done something special. <laughs> Hi there, my name is Sean Flaherty and I am riding Millennium Force here at Cedar Point. Right now we're going up the 310 foot tall lift hill. Now this lift hill is a little bit unique. It uses an elevator cable system, not like that of a standard lift chain on coasters found all over the world. Uh, the result is it gets you up to the top a little bit quicker. As a matter of fact, here we go, down to 300 foot drop at an 80 degree angle. takes place on the island. That's in the middle of the park. Woo! The speed on this thing is non-stop. Woohoo! Here is the second overbank turn. Whoa! Woo and back over onto the mainland, where we dive right into a tunnel. is one extreme ride. You have got to get here to Cedar Point and ride this monster. You will not be disappointed. Wow. Three months after Millennium Force opened in Ohio, the battle to be the tallest and fastest extreme ride was reopened. Across the Pacific in Japan, a Challenger Steel Dragon 2000 began to appear on the skyline. I think Steel Dragon probably is the definition of an extreme ride. It's the tallest, it's the fastest, it's the longest, and I think it's really one of the best also. It's just intense in every way. It just, from the time you go off the top of that lift to the time you get home, it's pure action and pure speed. It's 318 feet high, travels at 95 miles an hour, and is more than a mile and a half long. Steel Dragon is located at Nagashima Spa Land in Japan, a traditional amusement park featuring the customary assortment of family rides, water rides, games, park foods, coasters, thrill rides and holiday fireworks. I think it's the same for Japanese or anybody else. Once we climb a mountain, we want to climb the next mountain, a higher mountain. It's the same for coasters and other rides. We humans want more extreme things. Building the world's biggest roller coaster required outside help. The park hired Kawasho Corporation and Maiwa Construction of Japan. D.H. Morgan Manufacturing from La Selva Beach, California was also involved in the design and building. Many aspects of this ride are different than previous rides that we've built. We've developed a new coach in order to accommodate these higher speeds. That coach has substantially larger wheels on it. Because of that, we've had to change our track configuration that uses a much heavier backbone than our previous ride. The design of that track was the responsibility of Steve Okamoto, who encountered several challenges due to its length and the speed of the cars. A little variation in speed, which is due to uh, something like wind or even temperature, um, can build up. So we have to account for all those variations. And on a ride of this size, it's a very big number. It's also mighty windy today. There's a typhoon off the coast of Japan, so it's a little exciting up here. 
we got a real strong crosswind going. Steve also used his computer design program to calculate the g-forces of the ride. The maximum g's that we've designed into this ride is three and a half. If you're a hundred pound person, you'll feel like you're weighing 350 pounds. That's enough force that, you know, you get a real sensation on your body. <laughs> After nine months of construction and testing, Steel Dragon was opened. It's really quite remarkable. Last night, the first guests arrived at 11 p.m., and they waited all night for the park to open. I'm really very pleased to see so many people enjoying and excited about the ride. As with most new ventures, the proof of the pudding was in the eating. Well, I visited the U.S. park many times, and uh, most of the uh, U.S. you know rider is like a crazy, like a, ah! <laughs> like this. But uh, Japanese people, you know, like a little bit shy, and uh, as you know, after the take a ride, they they smile, but uh, not like a crazy. <laughs> Some of the first-time riders were definitely intimidated by the ride's terrifying first drop. <laughs> But to the surprise of park owners, most Japanese riders of the Steel Dragon soon learned to imitate American riding habits. This is the first Japanese hyper coaster, so that's why people is very interested in that coaster. So they love it, I think. So let's see how it looks from inside one of the carriages. Steel Dragon is so large that some people say it's three roller coasters in one. It begins with a 318 foot hill where riders drop at a 65 degree angle and hit 95 miles an hour. The second hill at 252 feet is taller than the first hill of most of the coasters. The next part of the ride is a spiral section, featuring two large slanted loops. The cars travel at 80 miles an hour at the bottom of the first spiral. The final part of Steel Dragon is a series of tunnels and seven bumps called Camelbacks for 200 feet. This is where extreme riders can relax and congratulate themselves on their fortitude. Judging by the crowds, Steel Dragon 2000 has lived up to its promise to deliver record-breaking thrills. Those who make the things know that launching and braking are the two secrets that determine the thrill factor of a roller coaster. Paramount's King's Dominion near Richmond, Virginia introduces another breed of scream machine in which we humans can enjoy our worst fears. Hypersonic XLC opened in March 2001, claiming the fastest acceleration of any ride in the world, 0 to 80 in 1.8 seconds. Hypersonic is intense. It's the best coaster in the world. This new breed of coaster shoots riders 165 feet upwards at a 90 degree angle. Then it brings them down the other side at the same angle of descent. The makers say all this and the smooth ride is possible because of the tires. These wheels are pneumatic field aircraft tires as opposed to the traditional wheels on a roller coaster which are urethane. Designed by a company in Utah, Hypersonic XLC is also innovative because it doesn't use a traditional chain lift. We have two 250s and two 300 horsepower compressors. Uh, each one of them puts out between 100 and 145 pounds of pressure. Each one goes through a dryer that dries the air, it filters the air, and then sends it out underground to our tanks out underneath the towers. We charge the shot tank with air, and then we release that into the piston tank, which drives the piston all the way down, 
140 feet, which is where we get the speed for the train. The compressed air propulsion system was designed by SNS Power. SNS is known for its freefall rides, which use compressed air to propel riders up and down towers hundreds of feet high. SNS's owner, Stan Checkett, wondered if he could take one of his vertical tower rides, lay the structure on its side, and launch it using the same technology. This is a catapult launch system, just like the ones they have on aircraft carriers. Uh, as the launch dog brings itself back and arms it, as you can see right now, the next train will be coming forward, and it will come up and grab hold right here onto the launch dog. With no other coaster in the world like it, it has crowds lining up at the gate. We're finding that people generally fall into two different categories. There are those that cannot wait to ride hypersonic and those who wouldn't ride it in a million years. So is it worth the wait? It was really good. It definitely worth the wait. We wait like for three hours, you know, we went on the line, but it was worth it all the way. I don't know, I like it better than my like credit like a roller coaster. Everything out here, this one's better. Whoever came up with the slide is a brilliant. It's, 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 it's a brilliant. It's a brilliant. That was something else. It was uh, nerve wracking at first year. Anticipation kills you, of course. scared the living mess out of me. I think I peed in my pants. I had an instant facelift. <laughs> very scary. That was awesome. That was awesome. That was very cool. So fast. <laughs> OK. When you first launch, and you get pinned back. It's just like. And that was going to just turn up 90 degrees. You just come straight down. You think you're going to go right off the edge. Ooh, that's the adrenaline rush. It, it left your stomach like up there. My stomach is still up there. It was still good. You go really, really fast and go up, and you can see the whole car going down. <laughs> it was way extreme. I'm talking about like. Breathtaking. <laughs> Insane. This is the ride of your life. Hold on. Let's do it again with the rider DeMonte Hunter in the front seat of Hypersonic. Right now, we're prepping to the launch area. In about six seconds, I'll be blasting off from zero to 80 miles in 1.8 seconds. Hold on. Oh, my God! Our survey of extreme rides should whet your appetite for thrills yet to come. Here's a sneak peek of other extreme rides being built or planned. Dorney Park in Allentown, Pennsylvania, unveils the 135-foot-high, 58 miles per hour Talon, the tallest inverted machine in the Northeast. Six Flags over Georgia introduces acrophobia, a terrifying 200 feet up and 62 miles an hour straight down. At Kennywood in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the Phantom's Revenge will feature a 235 foot drop and speeds of 85 miles per hour. Six Flags Magic Mountain in Valencia, California introduces the 196 foot tall, 65 miles per hour Deja Vu, the tallest and fastest suspended coaster in the world. And its X coaster promises to spin riders 360 degrees forward and backwards at 76 miles per hour along a 3,600 foot twisting steel maze.
The younger kids today seem to be needing more and more thrills. I think anything that's unexpected uh, will always be out there for them. I, I think we haven't found the limits to extreme rides yet.